Okay, settle in. Take a breath. You're not quiet. Okay, I see the tables where the troublemakers are at. <laughs> Welcome to another wonderful seminar. Um, a couple administrative things first to get that out of the way. One, most important, bathrooms are outside this door and to the right. That's number one. Uh, number two, the coffee and water is outside. As you can see, the room is at capacity. We had nearly 100 people say that they wanted to come to this seminar, um, and that is phenomenal. So thank you for those of you who are here. Um, we're going to answer the donut question first because that comes up occasionally. Um, a seminar like this cannot be, first of all, put on without people who are willing to be here. And as you see, Breedad has again done something different because we are different. Um, Mike Cheatham is here. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> and she will explain why she is here uh, via Skype. Thank you for being here. We have John and Marcy, who are both very busy people who have taken um, this time to give you the opportunity, all three of these people, to hear not just about success and the ribbons and the glory, but about the welfare and care of our beloved breed. Because there are two kinds of dogs, collies, and those who wish they were. <laughs> and you have, there are many wonderful breeds out there, but you truly have a remarkable breed. And it's because of good breeding, common sense, and those who have come before us and are with us and are willing to share. So if you would give them a hand for taking this time. Now back to the donut question. These seminars come at a cost, and the cost is skyrocketing. Um, the cost for <coughs> a dozen donuts is $44. The cost for a gallon of that precious coffee is $72. I heard some inhaling here. <laughs> the cost for the technology in this room now, and that's this room, is about $1,800 for the day. Um, that beautiful handout that you have costs. Uh, $35 is not doing it anymore. So just as a heads up, we are probably going to start going to $50. We've been at $35 for many years. So if you want to know why, that is it. And if you got this seminar outside of the CC of A, it would exceed. $50. You would be paying $125. Um, I've gone to some that were $150. It's not about the cost, it's about the investment. And thank you all for taking the time. Because we realize this is an extra day, this is extra travel, but this is something that is going to be for the benefit of the breed, and I thank you for being here. Now that being said, if this is your first national or first breed ed seminar, would you please stand? <laughs> Let's give them a hand. If this is, if you've been here to at least five, would you stand? Nationals or seminars? Okay. If you have been to at least ten, twenty. <laughs> 20 or more. Okay, there is a challenge now. Those of you that this is your first, raise your hand. You need to beat those 20 years. <laughs> if you look in your little beautiful brochure that we have, and I want you to go to another very important page. <coughs> and that is 
the wonderful people, excuse me for walking in front of you, the wonderful people who put this on. They are gold, they are naughty, they are fun. <laughs> and if we recorded our breed ed, on some days we might be arrested. But their charm, their dedication, their enthusiasm is unbelievable. Uh, Barbara Cleek, is she back in the room? She's Would you bring Barbara in from the hall, please? Um, is Lee Cohen in the room now? She is our mentor liaison. We'll talk about that in a minute. Debbie Holland. Larry Parsons. He's the bad boy on the team. He's, Larry's in the corner a lot. Um, Nancy. Mary Robichon. Okay, these are our core members. Now we have two other members on our team. Okay, Lee, would you raise your hand? She's a very important person during that mentoring. You all have these name tags. That gets you into the mentoring session. We have mentors. If you are a mentor also for us, would you stand now, just so people can make some eye contact? Look at these people. Thank you. There are others. When you go to that mentoring session, don't be timid. Talk to them. Find out who they are. They are wonderful. They're passing that torch. They're giving you that knowledge. They're planting the seeds. Ask questions. I know you say, oh, it sounds like such a silly question. There are no silly questions. Only questions unanswered, and you're not going to get it unless you ask. So please make sure that you do that. Um, so Chase Down Lee or any of the Breed Ed people, you have our faces in the book. So look for us. We're there to help you. The two positions that we have added really have been a godsend to us because the amount of work that this team does is phenomenal. Sometimes we're up midnight or past um, just doing things and getting things done. And those two new people we have asked are our interns, and it's Kathleen George and Deb Smith. Ladies, where are you? They do a lot of grunt work, and they are phenomenal. Now that intern position is a two-year position. So they are, I hate to say on their way out because that sounds so <laughs> callous, but their term is expiring. Um, and what they have learned in talking to them and what they have, they're going to take away, use them, get them on committees. They are workhorses and they do know a lot. So that's the blessing of it. Now, other things. When you have questions, we will take those questions as they come. Please make them pertinent to the topic on hand. If there's something that you want to know that is not about what we're talking about, hold that for some other time. Um, we will take a break. And I am the time Nazi. So if it says a 15-minute break, don't go out there and talk with your friends. Go to the bathroom, get your coffee, talk with your friends, because we will come back. Um, so that break will be taken. You want to make sure that's done. Now, when you ask a question, you raise your hand. You have to wait for me to get to you so that everybody can hear your question. And I'm wired for the recording. This will be recorded. Um, the DVD will be available. If you want to purchase this, I get no kickbacks on this. It is $18, and that includes the postage, if you do it here at the seminar. So see me, and we will do that. You won't get it until about June, Irv, or so? May. May. Whoa, May. You'll get it in May. And you can keep emailing me and asking me. I don't mind. I'll just send you one back and say, it's coming, it's coming. So if you want to do that, that's possible. And we're doing something new, too. Um, we just lost George Horn. Um, wow. We can't afford to lose these knowledgeable collie people and not get them interviewed. So today we are doing two interviews because we need something to do after this. <laughs> um, and we are uh, doing Janet Hitt, who Janet is here. <laughs> Janet Stan. <laughs> and we are doing Helga Kane. Is Helga here? She was going to try to make it here. Okay, Helga is here, but she'll be interviewed. 
And what we're doing a little bit different with those interviews is they're going to be available via the internet. And you will be able to purchase them also through Kathy Peters. So be watching for that. We do have one that we are nearing completion on, and that one is Lorraine Still. Now, Lorraine Still will be here on Friday and Saturday. And if you have one of these illustrations of the Collie, um, we have printed a limited edition. Nancy, 80 of them? Mm -hmm. We've printed 80 of them. They are available here at the National only. It has a beautiful piece about Lorraine in it. She is 92 years old? 92? She was born in 25. She was born in 25. Do the math. <laughs> she isn't anything. She is born in 1925. Do the math. Um, she will be here to personally sign them on Friday and Saturday. These will not go on sale after this opportunity. This is a wonderful resource to have. So that will be available. Um, and Mary Robichon, could you kind of stand up and wave to people? Mary is in charge of that task, so make sure that you see her there. Am I forgetting anything? Um, OK, that is $20. If you know somebody that wants this wonderful resource that you have in your hands, those are $10. And they will be for sale at the Breed Ed table. Can you introduce yourself? Oh. <laughs> well, if I introduce myself, then you know who to look for. I'm Pat Caldwell. I am the ringleader. <coughs> um, so if there are any problems, see me and I'll go, I don't know. <laughs> um, again, thank you for being here. Enjoy the seminar. And I will ask you, please, with the talking, it's, it's very distracting to people around you. I've got heads nodding now going, yeah, I don't like that. Um, save that for later. If you have a question, you know, raise your hand pertinent to the program. Are we ready? <laughs> we get the head nods. And um, I think it would be good if we maybe started with Mike and she can explain why she is Skyping. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, we missed you. Okay. I wasn't expecting that one first. Um, <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> first of all, how many of you have ever planted something and you didn't go quite according to plan? <laughs> so um, we started planning this national, my little group that's sitting right there, we start planning the next national as we're leading the previous one. So we had everything in place, everything was great. And I had a fish that came in season. That was great. I mean, it was perfect. We get her where she needs to be. She promptly stops. Hmm. She goes after season for no explanation, and we are just waiting and waiting and waiting. She finally comes back home, comes back in season. We get her down there. And I'm watching the calendar, and it's not looking too good. So we get her in, and then it's the weight and the weight and the weight. <clears throat> I usually don't do ultrasounds, but this time I had to do an ultrasound. I had my plans in place if there were folks. I had a great babysitter. Everything was taken care of here. But once you sit these babies on the ultrasound, that's a game changer. And this was particularly a game changer because they were not only bowing puppies, they're his last slipper. And so uh, there's a lot of emotion that I left the vet and broke home. And now it's the struggle. Puppies, my commitment to Polly and to the seminar and to the breed in general and my friends, I hate not being them. So I get home and it's just, it's major panic attack all the way home. Anyway, the puppy came on time. Everything is great. I have 10 puppies. <laughs> Wonderful, everything's going great. 
Uh, the first thing I need to do, though, is thank the committee for, uh, it was very hard to call. I called to Nancy because I, I did feel a commitment to them and to you all. They've worked so hard on this. And I knew this was going to be a bolt of lightning from left field. Well, not only did Nancy come up with a wonderful, wonderful plan, she, as always, was so excited, such a great cheerleader, such a great, no, you're doing the right thing, you're where you belong, and it'll all be fine. And she's been that way, the committee's been that way, and they put so much work into this, uh, and I appreciate them finding a way to make this happen. It's so wonderful to see you all. Um, I feel like I'm there, and that's very important. This is only the second national I have missed, um, and probably the 25 so years since my very first one. So thank you all for understanding. I want to apologize to you all as well. I would love to be there with you. And we have all that out of the way now so we can get on with the seminar. But thank you all. Thank you. Take it away. Does this work? Does it work? Oh, no. Where's the switch? Does it have a switch? It should be a little clip. He's got it on. He controls it. Clip it on you. Clip it on your collar. Oh. Just don't walk away or you'll. Okay. That's just for the recording. That's machine. just for that. You're going to need oh, okay. this. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm doing here. Okay, we, we've got what, it together. You know what? I'm just going to hold it. Anyway, first thing we're going to start with John had the idea of, um, since this <laughs> seminar is about bitches and their influence and how. Um, important they are to our breeding programs. John uh, kind of inspired us to do a little piece on Halberry Jean, who was basically the mother of the breed. So he volunteered to start the seminar with um, a little bit of history of her and her influence and how she still appears in our pedigrees today. So I'll turn to John and our hostages. You know, <laughs> feel free to ask them anything. You know, it's great to be trapped in the room with them. And, um, but there's no capture their wisdom. We can't get out. This <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we okay, hear a lot about need to speak into great dogs, great dogs in history. And so I'm gonna leave I know when I first guys. started in this over 50 years ago, the first couple of years I was yeah. just into the now, the present. And as time went on and I learned, I learned how to value the knowledge that came before us and the history of the breed. In today's world, we seem to be almost overwhelmed with statistics and ratings and numbers. But it wasn't always that way. When the Collies first started coming over from England and Ireland, most of the American breeders spent a lot of money buying the best of what they could buy from across the pond. But there was a couple of people up in Connecticut named Charlie and Lillian Wernsman. And they were more interested in seeing what America had to offer. So after a couple of generations of having these beautiful imported dogs here, they decided to start out and have a fully American bred family of collies. And their first purchase was a bitch called Champion Halberry Jean. In those days, you could add your kennel name at the end because the AKC allowed it. So a lot of the dogs you will see have a kennel name added at the end. Such was the case of champion Halberry Jean of Arkin. They bought her from a local breeder uh, and they paid $250, which in the 1920s that was, was an, enormous an enormous amount of money. People stood up and took notice because this bitch had such wonderful qualities, not only in her overall type, but in her head qualities as well. And in the few times that they bred her, she produced well in every litter. But what was smart about the Wernsmans was that they knew not only how to breed her, but how to make her an integral part of the pedigree. Those of you that are lucky enough to have Gail Kay's book, The Collie in America, we have some of it in here. There's been some of it in the bulletin addressing Halberry Jean. And Gail refers to her 
as the great American brood bitch. Did she produce enough to make her a rom? Nope. Did she produce enough to make her one of the most important bitches in the history of her breed? Sure. And she did it because the Wernsmans were smart enough to know how to use her in a pedigree. They only repeated one breeding that produced champions, but the other times they bred her to different dogs. Her first litter was sired by Allstead Eden Emerald, and that produced a dog called El Captain of Arkin. He would remain in place at their kennel for a while, but in a later breeding to Allstead Adjutant, she produced several champions, and among them, Nymph of Arkin. El Captain sired El Troubadour of Arkin, a dog who all the historians say was absolutely magnificent, with a head that was way ahead of its time. It was long, it was lean, it had nicely placed eyes. He was elegant, he was well marked, he was stylish. Unfortunately, he had some facial disfiguration, which kept him from ever attaining a title. But the Wardsmans were not stopped by any of this. He had some of the head qualities that his grandmother, Jean, had. So when they kept Nymph of Arkin, who was sired by Adjutant, bred to Jean, they bred her to Jean's grandson, El Troubadour. And that breeding produced champion Future of Arkin. To me, he is one of the key sires of the modern American Collie. And if you trace your pedigrees back, when I first started, we used to have two groups, basically. This would have been in the 60s of the Brandwin versus Parader. Now they're the Flatties versus the Fluffies. <laughs> but I will tell you, all great collies look alike, and it won't matter whether you're a Flatty, a Fluffy, a Brandwin, a Parader, a Sterling, an Arkin. The great ones all have a lot of the same qualities, which makes them look alike. And this was the case of future. He was used by all different breeders. One of his sons was champion Honeybrook Big Parade, bred and owned by W.R. Van Dyke. And Van was someone who had a lot of influence on Steve Field, and also in later years had a lot of influence on George Horn, was one of his mentors from South Jersey. When Van Dyke bred to Future, he got champion Honeybrook Big Parade. And Big Parade, of course, sired Silver Hope Parader. However, Mrs. Browning also made use of both El Troubadour and of Future. So the whole Sable Tri Tocallon line, which then moves its way into Brandwin, also has Future in the pedigree. And the reason that made Future such a great sire is because his pedigree was engineered and designed by these people who were ahead of their time. In the meantime, what some people don't realize, that between having four litters, Jean also was winner's bitch at the National twice. So she didn't get shown a lot, but she hit the big ones. So in a world today when we're so overwhelmed with statistics and numbers and wins and all the rest of it, I guess I always go back and I think about Halberry Jean and the Ark and Kennel, which to me was extremely influential, but it basically was a small kennel who used their head and whose goal was not always to have the most, but they were so proud of the fact that they really were one of the first American-bred kennels. And to me, Halberry Jean will always be one of the greatest brood bitches of all time. Okay. Technology. Okay. Can everybody hear her? Turn the Turn mic it on. on. <laughs> now? Okay. Now can you hear me? Okay, Marcy, describe your ideal brood bitch and which of yours most closely meet those expectations and why? Well, I think an ideal brood bitch, number one, has to have good genetic health behind her. 
Yep, it's on. Okay. Yep, it has to have good genetic health behind her. As much as you can know, because anytime you do an outcross or you breed to dogs that you aren't familiar with, something's going to show up that you hadn't expected. But you want to start out, at least know what you have. You're not going to have a dog that's completely genetically free of all problems, but it, you kind of have to have a priority of what you can live with and what you can't live with. And um, I think that's most important for a brood bitch. Number two would be to have the best confirmation and temperament bitch you can get. You know, you, you don't buy a bitch and she doesn't turn out for show, so you breed her to get a better one. Uh, no, go get a better bitch and start from there because you're still carrying all those faults that your original bitch has through your pedigrees. Okay, John. Read me the question one more time. <laughs> I'm thinking in Describe three. your ideal brood bitch and which of yours most closely meet those expectations and why? To me, the ideal brood bitch has to start off with collie character. That's what drew me to the breed. Just their way of being, the way they carry themselves, their deportment. And it has to do with their body image and their head qualities. But basically, a brood bitch to me is going to be one that has the most of what you want as a breeder. She's going to be the one that's going to represent you in future generations. And that's why you want her to have the most of what you want. Because it's important that in using her in the pedigree and duplicating her several times, if you use it the right way, she will be the advertising for your kennel. She will represent the things that are most important to you. And as Marcy said, none of them are going to be perfect. You want the health. You want the temperament. But to physically look at her, you want her to have the most of what you want and the things that are most important to you in your breeding program. And in the beginning, it's difficult for all of us because we're not always well versed in what we want. But I have met so many novices who might not be able to articulate exactly what those wants are, but they know it. And they, it's been interesting to watch over all these years some new people come along, and as I said, they may not always be able to articulate exactly what they want, but by their commentary on dogs in the ring, by their commentary on litters of puppies, they do know what they want, and that's important. And there are certain characteristics that are important to them. On the other hand, you don't want to take those characteristics to the extreme, and I think over the years we've had lots of peaks and valleys and fads and trends where certain qualities become desirable, but we reach a point where we've got them captured, but people want more and they go to excesses. You know, you might have, when the heads were short and people wanted length of head, sometimes they went to the extreme and we'd have long forefaces or heads that were too long for the bodies. During the years when back skulls were not as flat as they wanted them to be and people wanted to create dogs with really <laughs> flat skulls, well, the fastest way to get an early maturing flat skull is to breed for a shorter head. So we get the profiles in beautiful condition with nice lip lines and no depth and everything else, but then the head would turn and it might be shorter. When we wanted more neck, again, some people took it to the extreme and you had upright necks sitting on top of the shoulders with incorrect shoulder angulation, and it changed the make and shape of the dog. So keeping in mind exactly what's important to you and keeping it within the parameters of not what's in fashion, but what's in the standard will help you select on a brood bitch. I've been very lucky to have a couple of bitches who have been great producers, and I don't know that I could pick one out. Years ago, I had a bitch called Champion Tartanside Foolproof, who was by Debbie's Talisman. And she was the top producing bitch that I've ever had with 17 champions. 
And all those puppies were important, but I had another bitch named Arabesque who only had three living puppies. And yet, her grandchildren were equally as important. So picking one out, you know, is difficult. But through all the bitches, I tried to maintain certain things that really were important to me and not go away from me. The faults varied, but usually the faults stayed the same. And I guess I learned from Halberry Jean and people like that, that you keep the ones that have the most of what you want. Hi, Mike. Hey. <laughs> Describe your ideal brood bitch and which of yours most closely meet those expectations and why? Well, I think I can reiterate what uh, John and Marcy just said. I think first and foremost, you have to start with health. Um, it, it's just wrong to knowingly breed a dog with a health problem, period. Um, that's, that's a big one. Uh, the next one is um, soundness and breed type. It should look like the collie. It should be a collie. And as John said, the character of a collie, that's what draws us to them to begin with. Um, probably very high on the list, and I've just got four little things here. They have to have excellent mothering ability because that's gonna be passed on. And in the beginning, I let a few girls slide because I thought, well, I really love this bitch, and she's really nice, but she wasn't the greatest mother, and you pay for it a lot the line. So if, if you're not a good mom here, you're going to leave and go find some of these sofa. Um, you can save yourself a lot of part of later. The one that comes closest, I, I agree with John, it's not about the numbers. Um, I purchased one, one bit that was inbred on the Creek Choice. She had one litter. And in that litter was Owen's mom. So she was huge to me. Um, I've had a couple of, of rock girls and they have produced well. And not only have they given me something, they, they've been able to of some things to other breeders, which is extremely important to me as well. So um, it's, it's numbers versus that one or two very special ones. I would take the one or two very special ones every time I would go numbers. Um, Mike? Yes. Um, okay. In the, in the handouts, there's like a lot of pedigrees of these of the dogs. This one. No. Yeah. There's a lot of pedigrees of a lot of individuals that have been influential in their their breeding programs. And you know the reason we chose these people is because they. I am. <laughs> the reason we invited these people is because they have created an identity with their family of dogs. So. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because, Mike, what was the name of that bitch? And so they can look it up, you know, in the pedigrees. <laughs> the, the bitch that you bought that was uh, oh, the Rebel's mother. mother. Oh, I bought her <coughs> Her name was Rachel Glory of Southland. And she gave me one litter. She was bred to John's uh, part of Rebel. And, I mean, some of the dogs in the litter finished, but the, the bitch I kept um, was, her, her name was Rebel of Glory. And that was the only, only litter that, actually it was the only litter that she ever produced as well. So numbers can't be important when you're, when you're looking for that one very, very, very special one that's gonna move you forward. I guess numbers make it easier if you've got a lot to pick from and a lot to compare against in your own backyard. But just looking for that one is so important, especially when you're trying to keep your numbers realistic, um, where you can enjoy your dogs versus just nonstop taking care of them all the time. But that's she would that first one that I bought was Raptor Bell Warrior Southland, and she was in red on. Choice. 
And I can't tell you how eligible that bitch has been to me. Okay, uh, her pedigree, or she shows up in the pedigree, but page, page 13. Okay. Um, Marcy, you didn't name any. No, I didn't. And you have... I forgot it. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a few. Um, <laughs> well, I think uh, Champion Overland Endless Summer is probably the most well-known because, number one, she was a prolific bitch as far as producing puppies and caring for them. Um, she had a total of 28 puppies in her lifetime. 24 of them finished. Uh, two more were major pointed and two were plain sable dogs that got sold as pets. You know, <laughs> cause you, you can't keep everything and when I saw her first litter, I knew from both the sire and dam, they complemented each other so well that I knew it was, there was a special litter and I wanted to find the best possible homes I could for them. So I kept them until I had the right homes. And I think the last one that I sold that left was like six months old. But uh, I think equally important was her half sister uh, championed Overland Pearl of Wisdom because when I combined those two bitches offspring being half sisters I got dogs and bitches that were just dominant for producing the virtues that I wanted and both being by True Lies. True Lies went back to one of Nancy McDonald's dogs, um, the Napier dog, the Moretz, Buzzy. Moret's dog. dog, but Buzzy. But you had Buzzy. Yeah. Okay. And so that was part of an outcross that I brought in from what I was originally working with. All right. Does anybody have questions on um, this topic before we go on? We're good? Okay, if you look at the um, pedigrees in the handout, they were kind of a surprise to me when we started putting them together. They, um, I kind of have in my mind that their families are line bred or inbred, but if you look at a lot of the three generation pedigrees in the handout, there's not, there's very few names in there um, multiple times. I think maybe more in Mike's than uh, John's and Marcy's, but can y'all talk a little bit about that? Because I still have in my mind that they're, they're family bred and do you use a phenotypical selection process choosing partners or how do you use these individuals and identify which ones to mm -hmm. um, go forward with for your next step? Nancy, may I Don't make just, me just interject for a minute? Could you explain the difference between phenotype and genotype? Because there might be one or two here that are unsure. <laughs> Oh, I wanted them to do that. Okay. okay. <laughs> and I just wanted to make sure it was mentioned. Okay. Okay. We'll start, Marcy. All righty. Um, well, I've, I've always been on the look for things that I need to improve on in the dogs that I have because nobody's perfect. And if you continue breeding, line breeding or doing inbreeding on what you have in your own family, you set the virtues and the faults. So I've always tried to look and be open-minded and look for dogs that may not be directly related to your dogs or related at all. You know, you go back five generations, then there's not a dog in common. But they have the same phenotypical things that you're looking for. Now, phenotype is what they look like. Genotype is what's inside that they're going to produce. And sometimes the two are not the same. You can get a dog that is absolutely a beautiful dog, but doesn't look anything like his pedigree. And those are the dogs that you kind of have to watch what other people breed to, to see what virtues that dog is going to contribute to you. Because you look at the pedigree and you say, what am I going to get if I breed to this dog? I know what he looks like. But what else is going to come along? And that's the difference 
between phenotype and genotype. Because genotype, you look at all of the litter mates to a dog that is relatively closely related, and you can see <clears throat> what that dog will carry and produce forward. Because when you breed, anytime you breed a dog, no matter what the pedigree is, you're breeding what all of his litter mates look like too. So remember that, you know, if he was the only dog that was a great dog in a so-so litter, see as many of the litter mates as you can, and that will give you more of an idea of what that dog is gonna produce. Because you, you get a litter of puppies and you breed to this dog and he's beautiful and you've seen the dog but you haven't really seen much of the pedigree behind him. And your puppies are born and you look at them and you go, well, where did that come from? I don't have it. The sire doesn't have it. Well, three of that dog's litter mates had it. Now, I'm not going to blame the sire because your bitch is contributing too and you don't know somebody back behind your bitch probably had it too. And so you've ended up doubling on something that is in the genotype that you couldn't physically see. John? <coughs> about, Still Mike. Mike, about using families? Mike? She didn't hear you. Oh, is that Mike? I didn't hear you. Wake up. She needs to have I have always, well, when I first started out, I had dogs from a couple of different families. And my end first goal, I guess, was to somehow bring these uh, dogs into play in a, in a cohesive way to basically use what I had. And I have been so intrigued by line breeding, inbreeding, and and all that it can bring as far as setting a type or the, the vision that one has as a breeder. I think the first thing that's important is to have in your mind what you're aiming for. If you don't know what you're aiming for, it's it very easy to be swayed every time another pretty dog comes along or every time a pretty face comes along. Oh, I think I'll breed to that or I think I'll breed to that. But if you can stay within a, a family, and if you can find dogs that are virtuous with as few faults as possible, and utilize them as much as possible, you very quickly do find out where your virtues and faults are. But I think you can lead away from those faults if you are very, um, very selective when those puppies are born. And the more you do this, the more consistent your litters get, the more predictable it is, and the easier it is for you to, to see that vision coming to life in your yard. And last night I was sitting here with the puppies and thinking, and I thought it's a whole lot like painting uh, an oil painting. It's, I love going to the store and looking at all the colors of oil paints and I go, I need that color, I need that color, I need that color, and add them to the collection. But when it comes time to paint, uh, many artists use what's called a limited palette. And you put maybe eight, ten colors out, and then you start mixing the colors you want. When you have that painting completed, your painting is a whole lot more pleasing, a whole lot more cohesive, a whole lot more joy. Whereas if I put 20 colors out and started painting from each color, it's chaotic. And it just occurred to me, it's kind of the same thing in the breeding program. The more dogs you continually add to the mix, the more chaotic the gene pool becomes, the less predictable it is. Uh, one of the very best articles that I have ever read and I refer to this a lot, was, um, and I've written it out somewhere because my brain is not, Brackett's Formula. And I found it online on uh, the dog, dogstore.com. And this article was written back in the 50s, and it's a lot about line breeding, in breeding, and actually the dangers of doing outcrosses unless they're very strategic outcrosses. 
but I enjoy going back and referring to that. Um, I find a lot of comfort in my line reading. I have not done a lot of um, close in reading, but I have done some. And sometimes those are even surprises though. But um, I like the comfort of, of, of the known. And every time you go out, you are bringing in the unknown. Um, eventually, one does have to go out and bring in some different genes. And that's exciting too. So I, I prefer the reading, blind reading to having to be almost pushed to do an outcross. So, I'm going to piggyback a little on what Mike just said. <clears throat> it's easier to line breed and inbreed. To me, the real true test of an exceptional master breeder is their ability to outcross and make it work. In doing so, it brings up something that has kicked me in the head on more times than not. And that is that patience is a virtue, particularly to a breeder. If you're going to do an outcross, the brood bitch comes in again. Not your brood bitch, but the brood bitch of the sire owner, because I think it's really important to look at the mother line of the sire. Today, people show everything in the kennel, because we have smaller kennels. We can't keep as many, so it's easy to get them done. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, we had big kennels with 100 to 200 dogs that had a lot of mediocre stock. They were still weeding out health problems. They were faced with all kinds of decisions that they had to make, and so more breeding was done. But they only showed their best ones, and a lot of others were left behind. And I got on the scene just about the time that that was ending when kennels were becoming more moderate. But it was always instilled in me the importance, if you're going to breed to a dog, to familiarize yourself with the dogs and his pedigree. The whole discussion between phenotype and genotype is probably a little different today than it was then. But I spent, and, and most of my contemporaries, spent a lot of time on the road visiting kennels that had a particular look or a particularly good sire. And you wanted to find out what the mother looked like and the grandmother on the sire side and on the dam side, because both the mother line and the sire line were equally important. In looking at the dogs in that family, it made it a little easy, easier for you to do an outcross phenotypically. You may not always know what the problems are that are hitting there, or it may just be something that occurs occasionally more in one family than another. But familiarizing yourself with as many dogs in the pedigree is important. Years ago, I did a seminar and I coined the term bridges. And those are the people who have been at this for, say, 30 years when you're a 10-year breeder, which means they've seen 20 more years of dogs than you've seen. And that's important. If they have a good eye for a dog, and if they've bred some good dogs, and you can rely on their opinion, you may not get to see all the dogs in those pedigrees. But you can rely on the people who are bridges to let you know about those things. There was, I, I probably shouldn't mention his name, there was one dog whose pictures never impressed me, um, and that was Hazel Jane's Bright Future. I just never thought he looked as beautiful as some of the other dogs. But, I trusted the wisdom of the breeders that went before me, and everyone that I would ask would be get a big smile on their face and tell me about the timeliness of this dog and his length of head and his round muzzle and his flat skull and how that was so necessary to the breed at a given time that the judges appreciated him for what he had, including the fact that those of you that know a little bit about history, Mrs. William H. Long of Naranda Kennels, had a beautiful line, 18 generations of champion bitches, and was very respected in the breed. And back in the days when people didn't travel as far, she drove cross country to the National in California. Uh, it was 1949. But on the way out, she heard about this great dog future. 
And she had her dogs loaded in the car, and she stopped in Chicago to see him. And she was so smitten with him that she asked the two girls if she could take him to the National. And she drove him out to the National. You could put entries in a day before out there. She left her specials out, and she showed Bright Future and won the breed under Dr. McCain. So it was this great agreement and validation of some of these great dogs that made a difference. And people from that time, I mean, I, that was long before me, but um, everybody seemed to agree on the qualities that were there. And they would always say, well, you know, his grandmother had this, or his mother was from this family. So it was constantly, you know, looking at things. But I talked before about patience as a virtue. When you outcross, I, I said before, you want the ones that have the most of what you want. Well, if you're doing an outcross, you're obviously going out for something. Most people fail at outcrossing because they do the outcross and then they pick puppies the way they've always picked them and they don't put in the forefront of their mind, I went out to get more coat, I went out to get a better eye set or tighter ear set, whatever it happens to be. But then they look at the puppies and they wind up picking the showiest or the most glamorous. So that step that they took to bring in these qualities gets lost. So I think that's important to remember. And you know, if you look at, at people, Marcy's done some fabulous outcrosses and made them work because she selected for what she wants so she could upgrade every generation. And I think that's important. Yeah, exactly. When you're doing an outcross, you have in your mind what you need from that breeding. And when the puppies are born, there might be that puppy in the litter that has what you need, but it's not the best puppy in the litter, or the second best puppy, or even the third best puppy, but it has what you made the outcross for. So that's the puppy I would keep. The other ones, you know, wonderful show homes, great, and eventually down the line, I'll get to you in just a second, um, down the line, you may use that dog that's owned that you'd sold to somebody else. But I kept what I made the breeding for. And even though it might not finish, you go one generation, breed that back into what you have, keep the best puppy from that litter that has what you made the breeding for. And then that original one finds a nice couch to live on. <laughs> and yes, you had a question? Yes. Wait, wait, hold on. Wait for her hold on. There. You have to wait for two things. You hold this. Okay. And so that I keep Irv happy yeah. with me. She's got a I'll hold loom this. over you. Go ahead. Okay. So my question is when you are doing an outcross, mm -hmm. do you find that if the puppy you select from the resulting litter mm -hmm. has more traits that you went out for than your own family, mm -hmm. do you lose? some of the precious things from your own family. That's when you bring that right back. right back into the family that you're working with. And hopefully you get a puppy that has the traits that you had already instilled in your dogs and what you had made the outcross for. I also, I said before, patience is a virtue. I think when you do an outcross, and this was one of those lessons that had to kick me in the head because I did it all wrong the first two times. You need to grow the puppies out. If you're used to puppies who mature quickly, mm -hmm. who have flat skulls at four months or whatever virtue it is, and suddenly you pick this outcross, you went out for a pretty eye, but the puppy doesn't have a flat skull at four months, and you dump it. And you keep something else, and then later, you know, the people come to visit you on Lassie's birthday, and here was this <laughs> prick-eared dog with this beautiful flat skull and everything else, and you kept the wrong one. So it's tricky to outcross. And in today's world, when we're all limited to space, you have to be more stringent in your selection process. But you know, sometimes it's definitely worth growing them out a little longer. And I know people over the years have said, oh, but you know, nobody wants to buy them when they're five months old and they're gangly. Well, are you breeding to get them into those homes, or are you breeding to get ahead and pick what you want? And sometimes, you know, I've grown puppies out, and I have the gangly litter mate that I wind up my keeping. And 
if I have to just place him for whatever the price is, mm -hmm. he just goes. But it's always worth growing them out because what you keep from that outcross could have major, major effect on the generations of the family that you've created. So you want it to work just right. Are there any other questions? Can I ask something? John just said. Go ahead. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Tell her, go ahead. Um, I, I, oh, just, just going back to what Don was talking about. For many generations, I have wine bread, in bread. And right now, I mean, just I'm listening to him so um, in agreement. I've done my first outcross, and it's a big one. And it was a pretty different family. And we had one little four puppies, all four puppies stayed. Um, that's the only way you're going to learn what's happening, a breed that's not planned, that's so different for me. So when you do do the gap process, be prepared to keep up with you so you can learn what's going on and why you did the gap process to begin with. Did it work? Did it fail? It may be a long time before you know the answer to that. Okay. All right, the next question is, we did ask you about your ideal brood bitch. And you know, you kind of answered with a um, more generic answer about being good mothers and good doers and things like that. Can you use some of the uh, language in the standard to describe the priorities that you look for in a brood bitch that will continue your family and keep it going for the next generations? The, the virtues that you value the most and you know, maybe name some of the um, your favorite bitches that had the most strength of those virtues. Okay, you're getting it. Go ahead, let Mike, Mike is starting. We'll go reverse. Mike? Uh, yeah. I think the most important thing, if we're going to go to the standard, the word balance is in the standard a lot. And when I look at, at a bitch for the future, I want to see that overall balance, not just head property, but the body as well. Um, I think one of the bitches that I had that seems to personify that is Confederate Sky. Even if it's a puppy, when she would stand and have a big and the proportions of everything, and it was, it was beautiful. And she kept that in pink children, and she did pass it along to her offspring as well. In order to make sense of this, I have to take you back a little bit. In my early years, I was very fortunate to have bred a dog called Champion Tartanside the Gladiator. He, at the time, was a top sire. He won the national three times. He was a group winner and a best in show winner. And unfortunately, we found out he was a carrier for PRA. This was done at a time when we didn't have DNA, we didn't have markers, we didn't even have any kind of genetic testing. When it first happened, I decided that it wasn't so important to look back in his pedigree to see where it came from, but to deal with the present. That here I had this dog, he was siring what I wanted and everything else, and now he had put this terrible blight on the breed. And it took me a while to decide how I wanted to do it. I had wonderful friends that brought me some bitches to start using to that you know, definitely didn't have any PRA that they knew about, but we didn't have a way to know for sure. So I was very fortunate in getting to know Lon Rubin when he was still pretty young, and sat down and came up with a plan to try to eradicate the problem, or at least pinpoint the individuals. In those days, the only way to really come up with a plan for test breeding was to get a hold of a blind bitch and breed it to the various dogs. Well, we already knew gladiator status. And I will share one other little piece of information here. It's always been taught that PRA was a simple recessive. I will tell you that the gladiator was a carrier, but it was not so simple because it wasn't that many puppies. He had several offspring who produced a great deal more PRA than he did. And he had a lot more chances. But you, you know, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You are or you're not. So in trying to come up with offspring, I, I was able to buy back a gladiator daughter. 
actually two of them, that were blind. And we test bred them to, I had four gladiator sons at the time. But the only way to test them was to raise the litter to six weeks, put them <laughs> to sleep, have the eyes removed, and have the testing done through histopathology. About a year after that, we were able to breed the litters, keep the puppies till they were six months, and make good test with an indirect ophthalmoscope. But it was a very difficult time. And as a breeder, there's nothing worse than bringing puppies into the world that you know you're going to put down. But to me, it was the only way out. So finally, we came up with a dog who was clear and that I would use. Next step, find the outcross. You know, somebody that I knew from another family had a pretty great chance of not being a PRA carrier. But again, we didn't know who was test bred and who wasn't. We were dealing in the dark. Yeah, hmm? Dog. The okay, the dog was champion tartan side heir apparent. And I wanted a particular kind of a bitch to breed to him. And what was always drummed in my head from Pat Starkweather and George Horn and Mrs. Butler of Kenmont was the importance of breeding type to type, regardless of pedigree. So I went in search of a bitch who would have the same qualities that I had in the dogs and it was a certain head type. <coughs> to me, it's always been important to have correct expression. And I went in search of a bitch just to breed for him. And I hit the jackpot when uh, the two Js, Jim Fredericks and Jim No, <coughs> and Bobby Baines and Rose Solner did this combined breeding of basically two J bitch or pedigrees on 19. I got the pit bitch from that litter and I named her Tartan Side Fair One Fantasy. And it was a fantasy because I thought, you know, will this work? But she embodied all the things that I thought were beautiful. And I didn't breed her, I don't take any credit for it, but she had all the things that I thought were important and she shared the virtues with Air Parent. And so from that breeding, was the only time I ever did a repeat breeding because the first litter, there were four champions, including um, champion Tartside, apparently, who won the national. Um, but there were no girls because I'm not a big believer in repeating breedings. To me, if you have a great brood bitch, use her as many different ways as you can and double up and triple up on her in the pedigree. But we did this breeding, and to me, she just embodied one of the perfect brood bitches because she gave me everything that I wanted. What specific virtues did they share? Very specific. Fancy, her, her name was Fancy. Um, today, people might call her old-fashioned. And this picture was by my favorite photographer, Gooley Crook, and she looks very elegant. She was a very small bitch. And that was the other thing. Uh, breeding her to heir apparent, he was a small dog, and I thought, they're probably going to be too small, and they weren't. I got plenty of size. Neither one had an exorbitant amount of neck, and yet apparently had a great big neck with a big white collar. I think that was probably the last dog I had with one with a big white collar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she had beautiful turn of muzzle, and it was through watching her grow and progress, and I would take her to the Solners uh, because we did everything together. We had sort of a breeding coalition between Bill and Mary Hutchinson of Highview, Joyce Avery of Rivette, and the Solners, George and Rose. And we did it because none of us wanted to keep a lot of dogs. We had a little more creativity going in our program. And basically, line bred, but whenever we outcrossed, we always did it differently. And it was like, well, we'll let Rose take that chance, because if it doesn't work, it's not on me. <laughs> but that's how we were able to really combine some great gene pools. Because, you know, somebody, we think, oh, why is she doing that breeding? And then they come up with one that knocked her socks off. So it all sort of worked. But in watching Fancy grow, you know, it was the time I really spent time studying how a muzzle actually chisels off in front of the eye. Because we didn't pick them at 10 weeks or 10 months or two years. You continually watch dogs progress and mature. And I think it's an art that is lost today. And it's not anybody's fault. You know, when I started, most of the dog shows were still benched. 
And if you've never been to a bench show, they have these little elevated platforms with sidings on them. And the nice thing about it, with, I, I watch people unload at the National, and I thought, holy crap, this must take a data pack and a data unload. But in those days, we went to the show. My tack box was a little gym bag with five or six things in it. And you carried a bench cover. No crates, no X-pens. The bench cover attached to the top of the bench and went down the front. Your dog was there chained to it. But you had to stay at the dog show from 11 o'clock to 5. One of the things that was good about it that I'm just realizing today is the general public was at the dog shows because they could, what we do at uh, Meet the Breeds today, you did at all the dog shows. And I started going to Westminster because I grew up in New York and my dad would drive me and drop me off. But, you know, you were there all day up and down the benches. And my first national was benched. And I still remember walking down the aisles. The juniors uh, the week before had made all the signs over each bench of all the dogs. And it was like, oh my god, you know, country squire and all these dogs sitting on the benches. But you also had the opportunity <coughs> that if you were judged at 11 o'clock and you got dumped, as people say today, you went back to your bench and you had to sit there and stare at the dog that beat you. <laughs> but by the end of the day, because you looked, you would really, well, you know, I have to admit, he does have a little prettier muzzle or a flatter skull. But the other thing with benching is you got to see these dogs week in, week out. And these were days when it took a couple of years to finish. I remember the Solners had young children at the time. And one of their early champions was a dog named Wayside Wonderlust. And they were so proud of the fact that that dog won the Collie Club of Maryland specialty three years in a row. Not best of breed. Winner's dog, because they only got to two shows a year. So for three years, he won. And you watched him mature from a young puppy. And you start learning things about a back skull, about an eye. Because no matter how pretty an eye is, it may be four months. To me, if it's beautiful, it's even more beautiful at eight years and nine years. There's something about the final finish, the velvety muzzle, that smoothness and correct correctness that gives me goosebumps. Uh, to me, a beautiful veteran with a beautiful eye is a sight to behold. But in all that, I didn't know I was learning all this stuff. I just would say, there's that dog that beat me, and he did it again. <laughs> and you would start to look, and you would learn how important maturity is to you, to other people and stuff. So something else that we can sometimes be a little short-sighted on, because we're in a hurry. And it's difficult today. You know, if you have a 50 by 100 backyard, you can't keep four puppies from a litter and expect them all to be good. On the other hand, keeping numbers small, you get a lot more time to spend on your dog. And people say, oh, the handlers always win. But you, as a owner handler, have a lot more time to really invest yourselves in their training and, and growing. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Wait, Marcy didn't answer. Okay, before you answer, I want to make sure that nobody is interrupted again. If you have a cell phone here that is not turned off or silenced, please do that right now. I see some people moving. Thank you. Okay, Marcy, take okay. it away. Can you repeat the question? I know it's a short question, but my mind has <laughs> traveled for four days. <laughs> You know, you were talking about um, the characteristics you uh, require in brood bitches as far as kennel management and good mothers and, mm -hmm. um, you know, easy doers. But describe, use, use the standard to describe the virtues that you try to look for in every generation that kind of create your identity as Overland Collie. Okay, already. Um, again, all of us seem to start with overall balance. Now, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, John's overall balance and Mike's overall balance might be a little different than my overall balance. There's, there is no right or wrong in that, except if you, you know, if you just get too far from a medium. So I always select puppies on the overall balance. Now that's not how I, used, I started out. My mentors started out teaching me about head properties. 
and we would look at a litter of puppies and we'd only look at their heads. They'd be in an X pen and we'd look at their faces and we'd pick them up and we'd look at their heads, you know, and we'd look at their profiles and we'd feel the sides of their heads, but we never did anything else with the bodies. We didn't feel the top lines, we didn't feel the fronts, the rears, we didn't watch them move. And as my, what I wanted in a dog matured and the overall balance and structure of the dog became more important to me, my dogs, what they look like, have changed. And I think that's when you go back and read your standard, not just what the mentors are telling you, not that they're right or wrong, that's just what it's important to them. Go back and read your standard and find out what's important to you. And I think intuition was one of the bitches that I came up with when I was first morphing what was most important to me because she had this beautiful length of neck and beautiful length of head and she had nice angulation in the rear, good straight top line, great croup, great tail set, but she was a little short in the upper arm and I wanted her to be a little longer in back. She kind of looked, when she was growing up, she kind of looked like a flamingo she had this long head and this big long neck and I kept waiting for her to tip over <laughs> <laughs> and just go nose first into the ground because there wasn't enough length of body to balance her. So that's what I did when I made that. Her breedings is I looked for the things that she needed. And when her daughter and Liz Summer had a lot of the things. I had a little better upper arm and a little better length of back. And I used Pearl of Wisdom, the same bitch that I had, that was Endless Summer's sire. He had the length of body and he had the shoulders and the layback. So combining those two breedings gave me the longer back and the length of neck, the proportions that I wanted to see. And then I did some inbreeding and set that as what my ideal was so that I knew I would eventually have to outcross. But I wanted the outcross puppies to kind of resemble what my ideal was. So that's how I did it. I want to piggyback on something Marcy said too. You know, growing up as a kid, most of my friend's heroes were Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris. Mine was Steve Field. <laughs> and I was very fortunate when I went to purchase, not my first show prospect, but the first one that turned out, um, Pat Starkweather of Glen Hill lived down on Philadelphia's main line. And she had a beautiful Victorian home with an indoor-outdoor pool and all kinds of things. And she had a litter that I was to get a puppy from, which became my first champion. But Steve Field had judged the dog show that year and came back to the house. And very sheepishly, you know, this little kid that talked too much got very quiet and tongue-tied. But I asked him if he'd come and tell me what he thought of these puppies. It was an eye-opening experience for me because Everybody else, like Marcy said, with head, pick them up, look at them, take them out of the pen and everything. So we went down to the bottom of the hill where the puppies were, and Steve sat there for a half hour. And I kept thinking, is he ever going to say anything? <laughs> pick them up. And I knew which puppy I liked, but the funny thing was, in those days, we were not nearly as savvy about ears. And if you had prick ears, you had to really work hard to ever get them to come over. So it was always pick the puppy with the heavier ear, with the rounded tip. We didn't know about props or moleskin or Japanese tape or anything. You swabbed them full of antifagestine or pine tar and hoped to hell that it worked, but it didn't most of the time. But I liked this puppy that had prick ears and I thought, oh, I'm doing everything the books tell you not to do. But I kind of had an idea in my head of why I liked this one. 
And Steve sat there for the longest time. And he watched the puppies and said very little. Pat was speaking, and George Horn was there that day, and they're all chattering. And I'm thinking, I wish this man would say something. So finally, he leaned back, and he said, well, young man, which one do you like? And then I thought, oh my god, talk about being put on the spot. I like the puppy. The worst thing was I like the puppy with the prick ears. And they were prick eared that day, but there was something about her. And I said, you know, I, I know you're not supposed to do it or whatever, but I like that one there. And he went, really? I went, uh-oh. And he said, why? And I said, I like the way she carries herself. And I said, there's something, I didn't say expression, I don't even think I knew the term. I said, but there's something about her face that's so pretty. And he got a big smile on his face and he just nodded his head. I assume he agreed, I don't know. <laughs> so I picked her. But I noticed at the time that all of the breeders were constantly, you know, they'd get to a pen and look at puppies and immediately pick them up and start going over the heads. And to me, head qualities are of great importance. But I also learned to sit and really just watch them collectively as a group. Because you can tell their outline. You can tell their balance. Most importantly, you can tell their character. And to me, I always think of Collie character. You know, two really important things. So it, it isn't always about picking up and touching all the details first. It's looking at the balance. <laughs> Marcy, you mentioned um, about mentors. Can you name them? Well, when I first started, um, there was a gal that my mother knew. They were in synchronized swimming together. And her name was Pat Gorka. And when she got divorced and remarried, um, her name became Pat Forrest, F-O-E-R-S-T. Well, Pat Gorka, when she got her divorce, she had to get rid of most of her dogs. And I was able to lease a bitch from her out of one of I thought was the most beautiful bitches I'd ever seen, Champion Lierre's Amazing Grace. Now, she had acquired Lierre's Amazing Grace because she had been sold to a pet home because the people that Billy Gordon was big on these big, full parader muzzles. Well, Amazing Grace just had this little bitty muzzle, and she kind of had a, a weedy looking body when she was a puppy. <coughs> So that was when I started changing from looking and feeling heads to looking at the overall dog. Because you could see her body lines as a puppy. And you could see, if you were looking at the overall dog, you could see what she was going to mature into. And if she needed a little more muzzle down the road, you know, it, it was not veiny. It was round, it was finished, it was feminine. And I'm going, why not? Yeah. <laughs> and then um, the next mentor I had was Ben and Joyce Hauser. And I got to know them because they came to Pat Gorka's house and bought this sable puppy dog from a litter of two from Amazing Grace, because they were fans of Amazing Grace also, sired by a dog named Champion Lock Loman's Interlock, owned by Gail Wilkes and Joanne Thomas. And they also lived in my area. They focused on these big, round, full muzzles. They had dogs, uh, went back to Ginny Holtz and Joan Graber's, the old Coolmore lines and the old-fashioned parader dogs that didn't have a whole lot of coat, but had the beautiful head detail and the beautiful eye and expression. So that's how I ended up starting with wanting these beautiful detailed heads, and then seeing this little tri-bitch that didn't have it, 
but grew into one of the most beautiful bitches I'd ever seen. Okay, Mike, can you tell us who your mentors were? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> interesting to, to be uh, in the situation I was in. There were very few breeders down here, very few collies down here, unless they were running around on somebody's farm. And I guess the way I came to this was, was a little different. I had loved collies since I knew what a collie was. And I can remember one night sitting in our den, um, kids were playing the floor, Steve was reading the paper, and it just, this bulk lightning came in and said, I think I want a show dog. And, and it just came right out of my mouth, and my husband looked at me, and he said, where did that come from? I said, I don't really know. But, and I was probably sitting for reading the cob book, because I was already collecting them. I had already a lot of them. Uh, the books that are pretty foundational to the breed. Um, so I started looking for a collie in the area, and I found a breeder that lived probably about 45 minutes away. Her name was Raylene Hendricks. And uh, so I called Raylene and went out there and carried the collie I had at the time. Um, which was really sad. I'm glad the dog didn't understand what was said about him. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't much good. Um, but you know, it's the same old story. He's a collie. He has the collie character. We love him. He loved my children. He was a family. So um, I started going over there some and visiting. Um, and as time grew, uh, decided it was time to buy another collie, a show dog. Um, You'll be entertained to know the first show dog I bought was a Sable Merle. Um, and I still love Sable Merles. But I enjoyed showing her and doing what limited I could. Um, I was teaching and my boys were little. And nothing was happening much except for me, except in the immediate area. But the wonderful thing I discovered at the time were column magazines and books and articles and um i read them constantly over and over and over and looked at pictures and tried to figure it out and i thought how in the world can anything happen when i'm down here feeling so isolated because there was nobody to go see it maybe one or two other people and sometimes it's like a Oh, woe is me. I don't know any college people that are breeding dogs, and I can't go see what these articles are all about. But um, the magazines were my lifeline to the rest of the college world way down here in Petersburg. And, um, you know, now we have everything. We have internet, and that's a game changer. We can be instantaneously anywhere we want to be. But the articles that really pulled me along, and, and I think I was already plenty enthusiastic, but the articles that made me think, okay, this is possible, this can happen, were the ones that John wrote. Mm -hmm. And they were not only informative, they were inspirational. And I have to, I just have to say that I think reading is so much inspiration. It's not just the hard work, it's not just the physical aspect. You have to be inspired to do what you're doing. It's not easy, and it's discouraging, and it's exhausting, and it's two step forwards and three steps back. But month after month after month, um, those articles came, and some others too. But I always look forward to reading what John had to say and his wisdom, and um, and I was always inspired. And then got brave enough to call John a couple of times, and that was nerve wracking. If he thinks it was nerve wracking to talk to Steve Field, <laughs> I'm mortified to have a conversation with John. And he hang up the phone and go, I guess he thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure many times he did. But, you know, he's always patient. 
And even in our conversations, uh, he would share stories from his past and stories that made a difference to him and other people. And um, that that was always something that I can't put a a price on or a value on because while I was isolated down here, he was my connection to the rest of the world in a very real way. And I, and I had told John this before. I think long after we're gone, long after the dogs we are blessed to have, they are gone, John's still going to be inspiring people. He is still going to be taking that new person and bringing them along. And I was glad the book got put together with a lot of articles because that helped. Um, so those, those two were my, my main mentors. And I think as time goes on, I believe just about everybody has some, some wisdom or some insight that they can share if you're willing to just sit and listen or sometimes just watch what they're doing. It doesn't have to be necessarily what they said. It's like, how are they handling this? Why do they choose that dog? How do they um, make their next plans? But those, those two people were instrumental. They really introduced me to the dog world and the excitement of going to dog shows. And I'll have to say this right now. Uh, we were at lunch one day, and Michelle Inman will remember this. And that was the first time I had ever heard the word national specialty of <laughs> Okay, so what is this? And I can remember sitting there at the booth eating their hamburgers, and she was saying, that's where the best of the best go. That's where you go to the sickle, see what's out there and see what you've got. And I know Michelle and I were both in spot. And I thought, I don't know what this thing is, but I want it. I want to be I want to see it. I want to be part of it. And I've always felt that way about our national specialty. Um, you all are so fortunate to be there and have these great seminars that, that are offered every year. But just being there and the mentorship that happens right there is huge as well. Now, I think there's so much that happens each time we get the opportunity to go to a national. And that's why it's so difficult for not to be the national. Because the great things that happen is and you meet people. I, I know you're overwhelmed. I used to come back and for weeks it was like, what just happened? I, I don't know. Um, and you tried to piece it all together. And um, and now we look back over some of the nationals and realize some of the great dogs we saw, maybe before they were great dogs. So this is a great mentoring opportunity for for everyone and people that have been going for years and years, it just becomes even more precious and even more special because it's just added to your book of, of memories. Thanks, Mike. I know that in breeding, we always have to look towards the future, but my question is, what bitch or bitches would you like to have back? In what bitch or bitches in another family or that you have seen would you like to have back in your breeding program today? Alberry Jean. <laughs> <laughs> first up, first gets her. Okay, and then I'm going to ask another part. She was so long ago. Do you think that the virtues she had could be used in breeding programs today? That's a good question. Um, but I think some of the great ones are kind of timeless. And if you look at the pictures of Halberry Jean, she doesn't look like any other dogs of that time. I don't know which pictures we used of her in here, Howard but there's Van a picture Dyke. of her with Howard Van Dyke. Yeah, that's the only and that's in there. you know what? Look at that picture on page eight. Picture her if they had put her ears in moleskin and braced them up a little higher on her head, maybe trimmed out her skull a little bit. You know, 
I, I think she would be doable today. On the other hand, I, I'm off, I guess, in my judgment from a lot of other people. I haven't frozen any of my dogs. And I guess law, I don't know who, you know, just made me think about it. We used to always say, oh, can you imagine if we could breed the silver operator today? And it would all be like a fantasy, never believing that here we'd be today and it's happening all the time. But the discussion always comes up, if you had a certain sire back, would the puppies be the same? Because each sire brings to the table certain characteristics that are positive and a few that are, you know, are not so nice. But are they the qualities that would win at a certain time? And I think it's an individual kind of a question. I think the most important thing you know, is that people understand what the drag of the breed is at any given time. And that's the element that breeders try to stay away from at a given time because a particular dog or sire or whatever that was used quite a bit, although all of them, all of mine brought a lot of good things to the table, but they brought some undesirables. And people that aren't careful, you know, inbreed without being, without using stringent selection. And so the offspring, you start to see more of the faults than not. Or people let things go, and it becomes the drag of the breed at any time. And I think that it's important that A, you do know what the drag of the breed is, and B, you know, you find alternatives in doing it. Um, the other thing that I learned recently, too, about bringing dogs back and everything else, it was an exercise that someone had me do, who I have a lot of respect for in another breed. And that was to make you sit and write in detail what you really like and what is really important to you in the standard, but to be able to articulate it so clearly that it, it's in your mind all the time. Because it, it becomes like a road map. You may know all the words and everything else, but if you have the road map with all the roads and all you know, the compass and everything else, but if you don't know where you're going, you know, it's, you're just going to keep writing all over the map. So, besides Jane, is there another that you would you wish you could have back? Of my own. Your own or someone else's? Well, I wouldn't mind having them in the summer for a while. I mean, you know, twenty-four <laughs> jumpers on one of the puppies. Wouldn't we all have that? Right way, okay. <laughs> Um, you did okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you did fine. There's a lot of them I'd like to bring back for certain reasons. Uh, but with each new bitch that became important in the program, there are certain virtues that you want. I often refer to um, certain bitches as a cardinal bitch and the other ones as support bitches. Because you will have one bitch that is so good in her generation that she's the one you want to duplicate as many times as possible in a pedigree. And then you might take a litter. You know what? I did bring something. There's a breeder um, who is not in this country, but the dogs are shown here. He also judges in this country a lot. His name is Espen Eng, E-N-G-H. He breeds the Jets Greyhounds. And at a seminar I went to, and then a subsequent article, he gave his way of using these bitches. And if you don't mind being read to, I'll just read you a short piece because I printed it out. He says, we select the very best bitch of every generation. She goes into the tail bitch line, the very bottom of the pedigree. And I call her the alpha bitch. We breed her several times, producing three or four litters with different males that are related to her. So some form of line breeding. In this way, the tail bitch line always stays line bred. Again, we keep the best of that generation. Another alpha bitch and daughter of the previous alpha bitch. If she is the best of three or four litters, they consider her to be the best of 15 to 20 bitches in that generation. Only the alpha bitch goes into the bitch line. If she is bred with really outstanding, closely related males, she is very likely to produce, produce at least one outstanding daughter. 
But then we also have to produce males to breed to the alpha bitch. For this purpose, we select the second bitch, best bitch of a generation. We call her the beta bitch. But has been chosen to take the back seat to the alpha bitch and she will not go into the main bitch line. Okay, picture that in your pedigree. The beta bitch is bred oftentimes with an outcross male from a line that is strong where we are weak. As we breed on a small scale, the beta bitch generally only gets one litter and then gets placed. If you have a bitch line where the mother is the best of her generation, and her mother too, and also the grandmother and great-grandmother, it also means in your bitch line that every single bitch in the bitch line is not just good, but superb. Then you have a bitch line which you can line breed to at any time and for as long as you want. Let's face it, who else in the world is going to breed dogs for me? And also, he does not breed, you know, they keep like 12 dogs to do this. They are breeding for themselves with their own priorities. And the second thing is, just how honest is everybody else with you? Are they going to tell you that their dogs have temperament problems, monorchids, heart problems? When you make an outcross, just how much information are you going to get? What people would like to give you is a Photoshop picture on the wall, but they are less likely to tell you about the skeletons in the closet. If the outcross fails, okay. It was a failure and we don't breed on from it. But if it succeeds, we use those males for our alpha bitches. Thus, the bitch line is kept closely line bred at all times. We outcross only the beta bitches to incorporate wanted strains, I'm sorry, bad typist, wanted characteristics from other strains, but do not run the risk of ruining our bitch line, the main bitch line, while doing so. On one other point that has been brought up was this. When we were still amateurs in breeding, we often repeated combinations. Nowadays, we don't do that. We breed on a small scale, unless it is an extremely small litter. If we didn't get in the first litter what we hoped for, in which case we breed on from those, or we are not pleased with the litter, in which case there is no reason to repeat it. So I see no reason to repeat what you've already done. You either got what you wanted in a combination or you never will get it. Breeding is also about progressing and getting somewhere. Standing still and repeating is very unchallenging and uninteresting. I just thought it was an interesting piece and something to think about. Okay, John, I just thought of an exception to that rule. If you breed your alpha bitch to this dog, get all males. and you get all boys. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yep, and you're not keeping males from your alpha bitch. Right. And you know that combination is the right combination because the males are beautiful. Yeah. Repeat the breeding. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Marcy. Is there a bitch that you wish you had back, or just any bitch that you would love to have in your breeding program? Well, I would love to have had Amazing Grace. I've always been a big fan of her. She only produced four puppies. So, I mean, it might have been a waste of time for me to breed her, because maybe that's all she was going to give the world. But uh, I think she was one of those bitches that became so influential from the two puppies that were ever bred from. True grit and good graces. And I just, that's just one of those that I've always dreamed if I had her, that I, just for one litter, you know? And if she only gave me two puppies, that's okay, as long as they're born alive and they're healthy, you know, they stay healthy <laughs> and they can reproduce. Who would you have bred her to? Yeah. <laughs> I would have bred her to Summer Storm. Yeah. <laughs> Real easy question. And I would have been the first person in the list. <laughs> okay, Mike, same question. 
Uh, if I had a bitch that I would like to have back, it would be Southland's uh, Gloria's Rebel. She was Bowen's mom. In one litter, she had only two bitches, and they were both both beautiful. Um, she had one son that I kept that was Rebel of Glory that I also used with several of my bitches. So in one litter, she had me two very important strategic dogs that are still on all the pedigrees today. And that combination back with another bitch line that I had was the beginning of everything here. And so I would love to have her back, not just for what she produced, but she was what I love to call, many of us do, the meat and potatoes bitch. She was sound, she was mentally a beautiful dog too, I loved her, uh, but a gorgeous body, and her face would melt you every time you walked up and looked at her, that neck sponge. So she she could be here over and over and over again, and you know maybe I could utilize her more than just one one very quick really. Uh, I only saw this dog in pictures, but she had always just taken my breath because I think she's just a little classic, and would love to have had the opportunity to get ever in my garden, and that's all. Uh, Artside Fair Fantasy. Every time I look at her picture, I think she's just the complete perfect little bitch standing there. And I wish I had seen her and known her in every detail because I love what I see in those pictures of her. I add something to that. I also think, you know, when Debbie first asked the question, my mind was kind of going all over the place. <coughs> I think as a breeder, you come up with different males along the way, too. So I could change Marcy's question, too. If you could have any of your bitches back to breed to Richie, mm -hmm. who would it be? And it may not come out to be the uh, Amazing Grace or whatever. So mm -hmm. I think the question is so multifaceted that it would be, why would you want one at a particular time? Well, we were looking for bitches and who you would breed to, right. rather than if you have this dog. But she said if you came back and you could have one back today, and I thought today would depend on... But know. today, in your breeding program, right. is there one you wish you could have? Like for me... microphone, Debbie. Get over there. Yeah. Get over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, an example for me. I would love to have Fair Wind Fantasy to breed to Louie. Mm -hmm. That's where I am at my point in my breeding program. I wish I could go back. Sometimes hindsight oh, yeah. is much clearer. Mm -hmm. But you've got her back there anyway, far enough back. I know, but I want her back. <laughs> you, want, you want more? <laughs> she was a great one, and I would love to have her back. And I say great because I didn't breed her. I had take none of the credit for her. I was just the lucky one who was able to buy her. Okay, Marcy, I want to back up a little bit okay. because you said you'd breed Amazing Grace to Summer Storm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many of y'all know who Summer Storm was, but like describe him a little bit, you know, uh, the Siren Dam and what characteristics they had that made you think that would be, you know, something you want to try. Okay, uh, Champion Overland Summer Storm, ROM, was by Fantasy's Bronze Talisman out of Endless Summer. So you have the top producing sire in history and the top producing dam in history as his parents. He was the top producing blue in history. He had, I believe, 54 champions. And, and not that many litters. He he'd averaged probably four champions per litter from anybody who bred to him because he was so dominant for his look, which was a combination of bronze talisman and endless summer, the perfect combination in my opinion. And his puppies were born, you could pick them as they were born. Because at least for me, I'm, I'm talking because I owned the dog. Now someone else who had a bitch that was breeding to him would pick differently. but. 
I could tell which puppy I wanted when they were born. I mean, if they were in poor weight, it didn't make a difference. I could tell the body proportions. Now, I mean, when the eyes opened, if you had two china blue eyes and a dog, and it had big black spots around them, you know, you might not be keeping that boy, you know. <coughs> but it, he made my life easy. <laughs> and I want to thank Debbie for having such a wonderful sire. <laughs> you know, it, it just, it made life really easy. Okay, I'm just putting up a picture yeah. of Amazing Grace there. Okay. Yeah, I wish we'd had some show pictures of her. And it did, well, Pat didn't have any money. She never bought any pictures. You know, that's just the way it was. And, you know, this was back many years ago. We didn't have cell phones, and nobody was sitting at ringside taking all these ringside shots. And Amazing Grace wasn't shown at that many shows. So she didn't have a great show record. But, I mean, when she stepped in the ring, you didn't see anybody else. You just saw her. She knew what it was to be a show dog. The amazing part of her name was amazing. Yes. <laughs> and it, that's, you know, it, it, she, Summer Storm had the muzzle that I would have bred to her. He, you know, and doubling up on the ring presence that he'd gotten from both parents, I just, you know, I'm going, you got to make my life easy, you know? <laughs> so. Okay, No. All right, y'all don't let me and Debbie have all the fun. Yeah. So uh, if you have questions, be sure and raise your hand because we'd love to, you know, get answers for you. May I get through here, please? Okay. You have to speak into both microphones. Do you have a picture of uh, Oberlin Summer Storm? I don't think we have it here. Hold on. All right. Mike, can you close your eyes for a minute? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I might take a break, Mike. <laughs> Go check your puppies. Go check your puppies. <laughs> well, while she's looking for that, there he is. Um, okay. And uh, he had, he was one of a litter of eight champions, and he had some. A winner's bitch at the National, a, a bitch that won the Cam, um, a dog that, though Golden Opportunity was number three in the country at one point in time, but he had this most beautiful clear blue color, and because Debbie and I only live six plus hours apart, I'm going, I'm keeping the blue. If anybody wants to breed to a sable, they're going to breed to his father. They're going to breed to bronze talisman. You know, so if I'm ever going to get any stud services, which I wasn't anticipating getting, you know, it's going to be because he's a blue, and he's a blue bronze talisman endless summer sun. <laughs> okay, Marcy, could you just for a minute, and I'll come back and I'll get that question back there. Could you explain who Kem was and what the Kem is? Because I'm sure there are people in this room okay. who may not know. Alrighty, um, Oren Kem was a breeder in Indiana, and his kennel name was Lodestone, and he didn't do a lot of showing. Um, he bred dogs for himself, but he was very much into the working ability of his dogs and the head detail. He was there. Um, about the same time that Cherry Vale was being shown. And if you look at the Cherry Vale pedigrees, you would see a lot of lodestone in their pedigrees for the head detail that Gus wanted. Um, he's probably himself a genius at doing breeding, 
because he didn't get out. He didn't go to dog shows. But when you went and got a bitch or bred to one of his dogs, you got what that family of dogs was known for, which we don't have very many kennels now that can be known for going, you know, I'm going to go to, to Callan because I want the coat, or I'm going to go to Parader because I want the flat skulls. And we, as a generation, don't have very many of those places to go now because you just can't keep enough dogs in order to have that dominance in your pedigrees and in the look that you want to keep. I think Debbie and I, and I know we've both downsized in the last couple of years, probably had the largest number of dogs until probably, what do you think, 98? Probably. Yeah, when the economy went in the tank. <laughs> and I mean, people weren't buying show dogs, people weren't buying pets. And, you know, it was time, when, you know, we both kind of came to the same conclusion, it's time to downsize and just not worry about what other people were doing because we were just going to have to keep our heads above water until the economy got better. Okay, explain what the chem is itself. All right. The chem sweepstakes was started by five clubs in Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, I believe, in honor of Orrin Kemp. And I mean, this was a sweepstakes. You didn't go and win points for this. But you would get entries of over 100 puppies. It would be held in conjunction with one of the five specialty clubs, and it would rotate every year. And you got this huge punch bowl with, what does it have, 16 goblets with it or something? The little cups? It used to. Yeah, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was back when it didn't cost $1,000. <laughs> or if you could even, you can't even find someone to manufacture it anymore. So it's kind of morphed a little bit. But it was to honor this man's breeding program. And we go from the five specialty clubs and rotate every year. And it, about the same time the economy tanked, a lot of the specialty clubs folded. And what specialty clubs were still there couldn't afford to buy the Kemble to give it away every year. <laughs> and we had come to the point where they couldn't afford another Kemble, and so I donated a Kemble back. Because I'm going, I've got a couple of them. There's in boxes. There's, I don't have any place to put them. <clears throat> or you polish know. it. Or polish them, <laughs> yeah. And you know, when I pass on, I certainly can't take them with me. So I donated a Kemble back, and that's the one that Louis won. I just want to add a little more. Orrin Kem was a second-generation dog person. His father, Fred Kem, was actually the one who started Lodestone. Mm -hmm. But prior to 1970, if you were a Collie Club of America member, Along with your bulletin and your yearbook, you also got a subscription to the old Dog News magazine. And Fred Kem was a professor at Purdue in the field of agriculture. They bred cattle. They bred all kinds of animals. Um, but he was one of the great writers who always had an article in those early Dog News. And if you can find any of your friends who have been at this for a while, if you can get a hold of some of those articles, they're, they're some of the best, and they're timeless. They haven't really changed. But they paint a good picture of the Collie picture. So it was a celebration of the whole family. Mm -hmm. okay, we have our question here. Uh, hi. Uh, we know that uh, genetically, each parent is half of the resulting litter. But I've yet to uh, encounter many breeders that actually feel each parent contributes 
50% to the resulting letter. They, uh, they often say that, you know, the bitch is more important than the stud. Uh, has that been your experience, and do, do you put it into percentages? <laughs> well, I've always felt the bitch is more important. It contributes more. Um, mentally, she contributes more to the puppy's mentality um, just because of how they're raised by that particular mother. And when you look for a male to breed your bitch to, you look at his mother. So I'm always looking at tail female lines rather than what's on the top side of the pedigree. Because I breed to a dog because he has a beautiful mother. I also think there are a lot of findings today that um, are showing that the X chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA probably plays more of a role in the offspring than what the sire has to offer. Can you expand on that? Just that, you know, so many of the characteristics as they go through now looking at DNA and everything else, they're finding that so much more is coming down through the bitches. Um, we didn't always have the opportunity to look at DNA and everything else. And, that, you know, the ongoing studies are pointing in that direction, that they do have uh, more strength in the offspring. Mike. 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 Yes, Mike. Oh. <laughs> Wake up, Mike. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to remember it as close as I can. Um, people have said that you know the the male and the dog and the bitch are okay. contribute 50 percent um, each. Um, do you believe that? Do you think? I mean, do you think the bitch contributes more? I do, especially if you have, if you have. Worked on a bitch line for bitch or frick potent for their virtues to begin with, and that's what you're looking for for your main frame. And the interesting thing, the genetic part was that the line chromosomes and potentially hold more information. And if you couple that with the fact that you are building a bitch line, hopefully that will be dominant anyway for Perchy. I think the bitch is very, very dominant, potentially. And looking for a beautiful mother when you're picking your sire is essential. So yeah, I think the bitch is more important. So if the bitch is more important, start with the best bitch you can get. <laughs> Okay. But you know, Go ahead, Mike. To breed that bitch. It's, I know when I was starting out, nobody's going to sell you a great bitch. Nobody's going to even sell you a good bitch if they don't know who you are. And so sometimes, I mean, that, that's the wisdom. Uh, but occasionally, I mean, it was a couple of generations before I got to the point where I thought, okay, I've got a pretty nice girl here. And, you know, sometimes you have to come in the back door with, with this, and especially in an area where there was not a whole lot to even look at or see. Um, but, yeah, your first good bitch is the, the beginning of everything. Okay, we have one question, and then after this, we're going to go to our break. You've got to speak into both of them. Okay, go ahead. I'll hold this one. What's your recommendation for anybody that's starting over? Like they're getting uh, essentially their first foundation bitch and they want to cement those tributes and keep moving forward. Okay, you're at the right place. You're at the national. <laughs> okay? So walk around all of the setups and look at the dogs that are there. If somebody's got more than one dog there and they're related, you're going to get a little bit of an idea of what the family looks like. 
looking at the dogs in the setup before they go in the ring, you can get to see everything up close. Then find dogs that you personally like. And then that's the person or someone else, or they will refer you to someone that can, you can go see more dogs. And then you start thinking about where this dog is going to come from. You know, you're better off to try and get an older puppy or an adult than a little puppy, because little puppies are always a chance. I mean, we can guess by years of watching dogs, but, you know, some don't always turn out. Somebody recently said to me, I've been in dogs for five years, and I haven't won a group yet. <laughs> And I thought, <laughs> when I was in dogs five years, I hadn't won a point yet. <laughs> and I think, really, when I first started out, I was a kid. And I just wanted to be in the mix. So if there was a dog show and I convinced my parents to drive me, I was there. Luckily, the bench shows were good hiding places because my father would be good for about an hour. <laughs> and then the rest of the day, he just had to find me. <laughs> but through all that learning, I, you know, during those first couple of years too, I bought a couple of show prospects from, well, some of them actually from people with a good reputation, but you know what? I didn't know what I wanted. So they said, well, here's a nice one. And they quoted two famous kennels. It's half this and half that. And I thought, wow. <laughs> I didn't realize camels produce 50% bad ones, too. And I think I got the one. But I think it's really important to just spend time going to dog shows, going to mat shows, going to kennels, reading the standard over and over and over, and really getting a feel for what it is that you think is really important. And like I said before, it's an interesting thing. A lot of times at seminars, I'll have people take an index card, and I ask them to write down exactly what they think are the components of a beautiful collie. And I say to them, don't try and impress me by your knowledge of the standard. I want you to write down what you think is a collie. And then look at the priority of the way they've put it in order. You know, which were those things that were right on their head right away, I wanted a beautiful outline, or I wanted a this, or I wanted a that. And a lot of that selection process, if you've selected people to be around that are good mentors, or you listen to them, um, they help you to form that mental template that you will carry with you. And the people that do the best are often the ones that are lucky enough to select a, an early foundation bitch that has all of the qualities that they deem important and they kept going with it. So study, take your time, know yeah. what you want, and be able to articulate what it is you want because then when you go look at a litter of puppies and somebody tries to sell you a beautiful puppy with nice <coughs> ears and style but it doesn't have any coat, and coat is big on your list, you, you know, you're not going to get something that doesn't have what you want. Mike? Well, I'm the poster child for, uh, to not do what I did. <laughs> that, that night when I decided I wanted a show dog, well, I was on a mission. And by George, I found the show dog. I learned a whole lot after that one. She is um, no pedigrees, nowhere. She's just distant memory. Um, I can't put enough <coughs> emphasis on importance in <coughs> your time. Research. Look at what you love. Because as time went by and I looked at what I had and I looked at the dogs that appealed to me, there was an ocean of difference. And that dog was not going to span that gap. So, if you can start out knowing what appeals to you, knowing more about the standard, knowing what you're looking at, <coughs> you actually do you purchase your first dog, 
you'll think you might think of um, of wasting time and, and they're all doing this, but you're not wasting time. You're saving a whole lot of money and a whole lot of frustration. So walk around at shows. The National is the candy store. You don't have to go home with anything, but you're going to go home with a lot of knowledge and talk to breeders. And and when you do decide to purchase your purse, whether it's a puppy or a, an adult or a lease, I think very important advice is to find a breeder that you respect and that is worthy of your respect and that also has a mentor's heart because you are probably going to need that. You're going to have a lot of questions, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and hopefully that mentor is there to put you back on the right path and tell you no, that puppy's not always going to have this big lump right in the middle of the head. You need to keep it in the So they're going to be your guiding light to where you're going. But I, I think taking time and making the best decision that is the best advice any of us can give. Can I add one more thing onto that? Go right ahead. One of the best articles that my hero, Steve Field, wrote is an article called Consider the Source. If you ever get the opportunity to read it, and it does come up in the bulletin every so often, or yearbooks. When I started out, there was no internet. Um, there was a, even long distance telephone calls where, you know, I would call Pat Starkweather and be a $10 phone call, which today would be about 40. So we did a lot of letter writing. And I saved all those letters from all the people I would write to for stud cards. That was an education in itself. But most of your learning, I knew who the important people were, and even though I was afraid to go up and talk to them, I made myself available. See, the other thing about bench shows was there was a board down the middle. You had benching on this side and benching on that side. So if there were important people having a conversation over here and there was no dog on this bench, I'd just kind of sit up against the back of it and I would listen. And you would listen to the things that they would say were important. And you know, their conversations were revered because these were the smart people, these were the heroes. And so, you know, you would take all this information in and then look at dogs and try and make sense of it. Or you would read the articles of Fred and Orrin Kem and the dog news and things like that. Today, it's a blessing and it's also a damnation that we have the internet and Facebook because there are a lot of opinions out there. Like Valma said, who had Paradise Collies always said, opinions are like backside. We all have them, some are bigger than others. <laughs> but be careful, you know, look through the information, especially when thinking, you know, what's important in a puppy? And I know when I was getting ready to buy, I had a lot of people who were about two years ahead of me. Oh, don't buy from her, she's a crook. Don't buy from him, he doesn't know what he has. And of course, they would have a litter of puppies that just happened to be what I didn't want, but anyway. So I think it's important to also consider the source. There's a lot of written material out there. There's a lot of great breeders to talk to. But the people who do a lot of breeding and winning and everything else, they don't have a lot of time to sit on the internet and answer a lot of questions or write. So you have other people in there. So it's important to decipher it. And like I said, know what you want and select you are a foundation bitch or brood bitch by the one that has the most of what you want and comes from a family strong in those characteristics. Okay, I'd like you to look at your handout that you have. Can I have one more thing? Go ahead, Mike. This, I'm sorry, but what, what John just ended on just kind of sparked something. Uh, we, and, and I will go back to that very first bit that I think was so pivotal in that Acterville, um, Gloria Southland that I bought. Um, I came home and and I had been breeding for a while, but I knew which direction I wanted to go in. And I walked in home from school, sat down with my little snack, opened the magazine, and there sat one of the most beautiful bitches I think I've ever seen in my life. Like a zombie, I get up, go over there and call, and hear that no way can I afford the price of this beautiful bitch sitting there. But I was stunned by her. She was just sitting out in the field. And I got 
that's the first time I had really called a known reader and inquired about dog. And promptly found out, no, I could not afford her, but she did have two daughters. So that, that was one of the most important phone calls that I've ever made. And I also stupidly bought this bitch by unseen. Hmm. So if you want to make a list of mistakes, you can just call me and I'll help you get that list. <laughs> <laughs> and um, luckily, the lady I was speaking with, Joy Spire, she, she could articulate exactly what that bitch was. And, it, and when I got her, she was exactly what she said she was. And so sometimes you don't get to start with exactly what you want, but you may be pretty happy with the close second. And the close second was her daughter that was so important here. Sorry. Not a problem. Okay, look right inside the cover. The very first thing we have there for you, and you will always get when you come to a breed ed seminar, is a copy of the standard. And all three of these speakers have spoken to the importance of that standard and not just knowing it, but understanding it and living it. So make sure you read it and read it often. Then I want you to turn back to, because all three of these people have also spoken about the national, how important it is to be here, turn to pages 33 and 35. This is your primer. This is a good guideline for how to get the most out of this national. Go and look at the dogs. Before you touch them, do just what John got through his experience. Sit, stand, look. Ask people, touch people. You're going to that mentoring session, don't be shy. Ask the questions. You will be amazed. Um, the other thing that was brought up, and it's a good point because some of you are sitting here and I saw heads and I heard people going, yeah, that's right. You want that beautiful bitch who's going to sell you one. Do you remember being in that place? Some people got those beautiful bitches, or those, and they were beautiful not because they were going to, as you said, win everything at the show because it's not about the show. Remember, it's about the Collie and keeping our breed viable, healthy, and true to who a Collie is supposed to be. You sit at the feet of good mentors and they will capture you and take you along if you're willing to listen. And I don't know, I'll use my daughter as an example, I don't know anybody that I thought was busier. Of course, I was a little bit ignorant at the time, too. I get it, Mike. Um, I didn't see anybody busier than Debbie Holland, and my daughter wanted to breed her bitch to a dog that I loved. So she approached Debbie Holland when she was like 11 or 12 at a national. I was with her because I don't just send my children out. I'm, I'm the mom. I was the shadow. And Debbie Holland put down her brush <laughs> and said, bring your bitch here. And Allison ran and brought the bitch. And she said, now go tell your mother to pick up these pedigrees. And she looks stunned. I get to tell my mom what to do? Cool. She loves Debbie now. I got the pedigrees and Debbie said, that dog is not right for this bitch. Years later, Debbie mentored my daughter, and Allison, I think, has done quite well. And it's because Allison was willing to sit at the feet of Debbie Holland. You've got to be willing to do that. Find those mentors. She's had many mentors. Debbie is her keystone. Um, the other point, dying clubs. If you are a member of a struggling or dying club, and by struggling, I mean you may have five members that are killing themselves happily. Raise your hand. <laughs> if you are not a member of a club, raise your hand. Hi. 
It's not a shame. You may not be in an area. Debbie doesn't live where there are any clubs. You need to be the supporting members of this club. If there is a club in your state that is near you and you can help them financially, if you can go to the club and do some of the grunt work at those shows, those clubs are instrumental to what you see happening here. We need those clubs, so please find them and help them. Um, and then the other thing is downsizing that they talked about. We're getting to be a small group and we have to keep our breed viable. You are helping that by what you are doing. Don't keep this a secret. Go out and seed it. Now, uh, the Nazi is back. Okay. The time is by my watch, so it doesn't matter what mine says, just as you want to know that. In 15 minutes, you will be back here. I have 1025, so Mike, you can be gone for 15 minutes. <laughs> and I will be out there ushering you in. Thank you very much. Before you go, let's give them a round of applause for this. <laughs> <laughs>